Thank you for listening to a Sunday morning sermon from First Christian Church. For more information about these sermons or FCC in general, visit us online at FCCFlora.com. We're excited that we get to continue our series of Vertical, a series on prayer. And, and last week, uh, God talked to us through the Lord's Prayer. He used that as an opportunity for us to share and, and impart with Him to understanding the words like we've never heard them before. And, and I'll be honest, I, I thought... Something amazing was happening saying I was like, I was watching the Bears Packers game in the first half. And that first half, I was like, God heard my prayers and answered my faithfulness. And in the second half, he said, My kingdom, my will be done, and it is all crashed down. So so we're still waiting for some more unanswered prayers. But man, I, I'll tell you what, he took he was able to take what I thought was a high and he put it to a low real fast, right, Mark? And so we we experienced like our faithfulness has been restored. And then his kingdom, his will be done. So those words have never rang true except for last week. But it's a new day. So, but today as we get started, we're going to continue in our series here. And today my prayer is that you continue to have this conversation with God, that we'd be able to help fuel that, that he begins to know you for who you are. So if you would, let's bow with a word of prayer. And as we have been doing, let's approach slowly and quietly. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of life, the surplus, the blessings we experience every day, that we get to know your presence, we get to know your, your love and blessings for us, and the opportunity that we often overlook is that we get to come before you. We can address you as Father, Creator, banner, our guide, our rest, our shelter. We're able to present ourselves to you in these magnificent ways, in the depths of your presence. But God, we also understand a need and desire for our lives to continue to communicate and fellowship with you. A sense of this open and honesty approach that it comes to when we approach your throne and so we just ask that that conversation can continue. You help guide and lead us in this way as we learn what it means to talk with you, to share with you. Allow us to listen, to hear your voice today. In your name we pray, amen. So we begin to see as we've examined week one, what is prayer and what are some of those things that we often question about prayer and how we would ask and how we approach. And we saw that there's a need and desire for us to come in this open and honest way, that there was truth in how we would come and what we'd request and wonder. And then last week, it was the Lord's Prayer as we were taught how to pray, how Jesus taught his disciples. They witnessed him praying in such a way where they had to stop, stand up. I need to know how to do that, Lord. Teach us how you did that, how you prayed. In the same way, the depth of the words that we say and how we say the Lord's Prayer, and so often we say it so quickly, we overlook the meaning behind them and what it truly means for us to pray. And so today, it's beginning to examine what it means for us to develop a deeper knowledge in prayer, that he would know me, that he would know you. And for some of you, they're like, well, I don't Oh, that's scary, Right? It's worrisome because of what does that mean for him to actually know me, to, to know about me, to be concerned because we think about this, our whole goal is just to have a deeper conversation. It's just, not just fellowship, but now we're actually conversing. We're there in the presence of God. To share these things together in this way. And so for us, we see that this is God getting to know you. Now, many of you might say, well, he already knows everything. He knows all about me. He knows that." But to actually verbalize it, to allow him to be in, to be part of it, it's more than just saying he knows, but to actually discuss and to share those things with him. Because let's be honest, the whole point is for us to communicate with God is to be drawn closer to him. But through most of our prayers, we pray safe. Bless me, lead me, protect me, guide me. Just like we looked in the Lord's Prayer, it's all these us's we had in there, but not really the depth of the conversation, no response back, so we'd be listening and guiding ourselves in this way. We ask that so often we ask God to fulfill my needs, a me, 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 rather than God, where would you lead me? What would you show me? Tell me, answer me. 
And so today we're going to look at David. And David uses this prayer here where he steps outside of his comfort zone. And I don't know about you. I don't know the last time you said, Heavenly Father, today is the day. I put me outside of my comfort zone. Anybody? No? Okay. We don't have to get out early now. We can go finish the rest of it. But think about this. Because I was thinking about this. That in the moment, if I'd say, Lord, lead me outside of my comfort zone with these restrictions, right? Lead me outside my comfort zone of one of these three places that these three conversations are taking place, that this happened in their lives, and all I have to do is say amen, pray with them, hug them, and it's good. Woo! Outside of my comfort zone. It's a big deal. But when I say, Lord, lead me outside of my comfort zone, I'm giving him an open opportunity to take my life and to do whatever he wants with it. And that's scary. That's bold. And so imagine David here as he's in this moment, he's under attack. His enemies, God and his enemies are crowded around him. They're pressuring him. He's under this attack. And now not only are they coming after him, but they begin to communicate after him that says, He's lying. His motives are wrong. So not only is this a physical attack, but it's this verbal onslaught that he's facing from all sides and all angles. And what is our normal reaction when that's us? We look left, right, back, forward. How am I going to attack? No, 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 it's me. I'm going to stand up for what I believe. And he says, he stops. David pauses. He stops looking horizontal. And he looks vertical. And he goes into prayer. He takes this moment to enter into prayer with God for his moment, for his enemies, for all these things. We see this in Psalms 139. If you want to turn this for the table, we're going to look at these two verses today and stay in this area all day so we can begin to examine this. But here's the thing. Rather than continue after his own will for his own defense, he turns to God. That God would have begun to examine him in the moment of this crisis. See, our common reaction is, I'm going to tell them what I believe. I'm going to tell them what's truthful. I'm going to stand up for this and react. And rather, he just goes in and says, God, I need to come before you now. And this is what we begin to see. That we begin to live vertically and pray that God may know our hearts. That he might know us. So in Psalms 139, 23 and 24 says this, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. What a prayer. It's not safe. It's not quiet. It's bold. It's powerful. That God would reveal, that he's praying that God would truly reveal who he is and open up about what is taking place here. And the ultimate question is, what am I missing in myself? Right? You can ask your friends, your peers, what am I missing in this? But to go to God who can see all, who can encounter all of us, to reveal the depths of that, wow, what a bold prayer in this moment here. The problem is when we think about God entering into our hearts, we begin to wonder, well, what do I have left in my heart? Because we all have those moments, those places, those situations, those circumstances we've held on to, we've clung to, the past, forgiveness, it's all there, clung tight. We don't let it escape. So for him to examine our heart, it's saying, you're going to see all of that. See, sometimes we store things up in our hearts. We clog up the space that we have. I don't know how many of you ever liked the show Hoarders. If you're a hoarder, I apologize. But if you've ever liked, if you've ever watched the TV show Hoarders. But here's the thing that I was looking at. And I realized that there are 19 million people in the United States alone who have declared themselves as hoarders. 19 million, just in the United States alone, who've declared themselves as hoarders, right? And if you've ever seen the TV show, it's like they go through, they clean out the house and they're inside the house. You find all the sorts of weird stuff they've collected. You know, you've got a cat that's been taxidermied over here and just hidden things. You're like, where do they keep this stuff? And where have they found this stuff? But it's been hidden amongst all the stuff their entire Life. And the same way we are with our hearts, we hold this down, we, we clog it up, and we need freedom from this. See, here's the thing. They've been just living amongst the trash, the filth. The Learning Annex, a chain of adult education schools, says there's been more than 200,000 people who have completed its popular class on controlling household clutter. 
There's a class, a school, how to handle clutter. Who takes the course, people who keep empty mayonnaise jars, manuals for appliances they no longer have, broken buttons or out of date phone books. Household clutter occupies space, saps energy and creates frustration. This is their list of who they target in their classes. 200,000 people have completed this course on how to clear clutter from their lives. Amazing. And yet, for many of us as Christians, we're spiritual hoarders. We've allowed clutter to just fill our hearts, to contain and to gap the space, to suck energy out of our lives. Are we a hoarder, right? Do we have unsolved issues, things we just can't part with? How can we clean up the jumble mess of our lives today? And so today, as we begin to examine these two verses, we're gonna help us out in this way. We're able to break it down as you begin to see here in the next slide. This is our prayers for the week. As they're separated here, for us today. Search me, know my heart, know my anxious thoughts, any offense the way of me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. It's how we broke it up today that we can examine this together. So the first part that we begin to see here is search me. Search me, God. And this is what's interesting about this, because many times we can pray a prayer, but to begin to give God an invitation to come in and to search your heart is remarkable. It's a bold prayer because let's put it out this way. If you are allowing someone to get to know your life, do it this way. Here's the keys to my house. Go examine everything in my house to get to know me. Yes, hear that grumble right there? Yeah. Because you're like, what if they find my guilty pleasure in movies? Or what if they find the, the pile of sweets I keep at the house that I don't ever know that I'm... See, we, we don't want people to know the full truth about us. So for us to allow God to venture into my heart and say, God, please examine and search me. You're giving him the freedom and the opportunity to enter into your life and to examine all parts of you. Wow, right? I mean, what a prayer in itself that says, God, here I am, look, see what's there. Because we have all of those things that we've hidden, we've stashed away that we don't want. And they've just cluttered our lives. But at the same time, it's like, I just don't want to take it before God. And so David, in the midst of attack, he begins to look at himself first of God, what would you need from me? And, and examine me, who I am and my heart that I have here. That God would begin to reveal the changes inside of us. By opening up in this prayer, we begin to allow God to reveal inside of us what needs to be revealed. What's been hidden away for far too long. Are we listening? When he says things, do we hear what he's crying out to us to be changed, to be moved? It's allowing God to speak even when we don't want to hear. But we're allowing him to have the opportunity to examine and to see us. Because we understand when God begins to search that spiritual transformation that takes place, when he begins to examine, his spirit moves in the midst of us. And for you and I, this is what we begin to discover when he searches us. He begins to reveal even what we don't want to hear in hopes that it draws us closer to him. He's removing the things that have held us back, that's kept us separate from him for far too long. And he says, if you allow me to search you, you'll allow me to remove those things that help me draw closer to you rather than barriers that keep us separated. And then it carries in that he would search me, but then he would also to know my heart. And this is the interesting phrase because we probably use it far too often, affirming too many ways that aren't true, right? Have you ever said the phrase, well, they have a good heart? Nobody, right? Now, I don't want to admit to it now because I already made it look bad. All right, so, but they have a good heart. That They have a great heart for this or for that. But what we understand is our hearts are deceivers. They're liars, on their own, they'll seek after their own ambition, their own ways. And sometimes it's knowing that my heart might be stuck in my own ways or after my own thoughts. I'm not in line with God's kingdom in his way. And it's this transformation that takes place inside of the heart. And probably one of my favorite phrases from the beginning of ministry that I've heard was, what fills your heart will lead your life. I say this all the time to myself, what is ever filling my heart is gonna lead my life. 
Whatever allows to take precedence inside of my life is going, it's going to lead me. And I always use the illustration, it's young high school love, boy meets girl. Now boy goes a different way to his locker because he wants to go by her locker. He goes the long way around to class so he can walk with her to class. His afternoon activities was no longer playing Fortnite, but now he's texting her while he's playing Fortnite because he's doing those things. See, what we begin to see is our life and our habits change when new things enter into our heart. And to control our heart, to understand what is entering, what is taking hold, what is held captive inside my heart is going to determine the ways and the paths in which I live. And so what he begins to say is when he says, know my heart to search me, you know what's there, you know what my ambition is, and you know what is leading me, God. And for some, as they, he says, God, you're there, you're in presence, you're the one that's in my heart. You dwell here, you're the, my lead, but for many we have to begin to question and wonder what is truly holding the space of my heart because that is the direction which my life will follow. And he leads us in this way for us to remind us that our heart can be greedy and wicked. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things but and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, our heart can be good, but only with God. Only when we get a heart transplant, when our heart becomes like him is our heart good. Because on my home, my heart is greedy, self-seeking, and wondering. And on top of that, it's a liar. It justifies my things amongst the worlds, right? Think about this, the lies that it tells us about others. I don't have pride. I can't help that I'm better than everyone else. But I don't have pride, right? I don't lust. I can't help they look good. What, what about, I don't gossip, Everyone needs to know what's going on anyway. Someone might as well tell. We justify things all the time with our hearts. But, and here's the thing. It's always with others. But what happens when those lies begin to tell you things on top of it about yourself that aren't true? The lies that we tell ourselves that are damaging sound a lot like this. I'm not doing enough. When I have these things, I will have enough. I'm a failure. No one understands me. I'll be alone forever. I can't move forward because of my past. It's my parents' fault. Or I'm not enough. These are the lies of our heart that they tell us as we experience life. And these lies build up into fears and worries about who we are and our worth and our existence here on earth. It begins to make us anxious as he says to know my anxious thoughts, my worries. My worries become fears and these lies build up inside of us. Our hearts are quick to lie to us about who we are. And this is where Satan steps in to attack. He says, that's the very place I know you're weak and I can control you from there. But here's what we begin to see. Fears of the heart are way different than fears of this life. It's not about the fear of the dark or fear of spiders or fear of the monster under your bed. But it's the fear of knowing that you could be so much more and yet you believe the lie. The world tells you you're not enough. In every area where we feel weakness, this is begins to see and show light into the fact that that's the moment where we have to trust our faith in God so much more. The weakness that we begin to display is where we need faith the most. That God would move in such a way that he would consume our hearts where he says, I know your heart, I know this is where you're fearful. Let me take over that place of your heart. So as you walk every single day, trust is building and abounding in those moments and places. So therefore, he says, to reveal my anxious thoughts, to reveal my anxiety, my worries, my concerns, is because he says, I can handle them. I can take hold of those. To allow us to take hold of our lives. And maybe for many of us, it's the expectation of, of what things should look like or how they should be handled or the way it works. But not one of us is the same in our walk and our worries and our fears. And even within the blessing that God's given you. But here's the thing. So many of us, we just keep on going. You ever say that to yourself, those lies? I've got this. I'll be fine. It'll pass. I'll get over it. When God's inviting us in, then he says, I know you're anxious. I know you're worried about this. Give it to me. He asks about these offensive ways in us. 
And David begins to realize that there are things in my life and my worries and my concerns that sometimes I've allowed sin to creep in and take a hold to be my guide. And I've given too much to the kingdom of this world and not to the kingdom of God. And when he begins to pray this offensive way in me to reveal this in this way, God, what he's doing, he says, God, reveal whatever is inconsistent in me that is not consistent with your truth. Talk about a prayer. To say, God, whatever is displeasing to you about me, reveal it to me. Show me in this way. We can make excuses all the time. And what's amazing is, is that we're able to spot sin in the life of others so much easier than it is to spot the sin in our own lives. Because our heart's a liar. But here's the thing that I love about this prayer. Because it has been bold. And it's not easy in the way that David approaches us in the midst of his circumstances as he's looking towards heaven, as he begins to pray for the work that's taking place in here in the midst of his life. In the midst of the chaos and the attacks and the words that are being said, he goes to the core of it. And he says this, lead the way. A powerful way to remind us that it wasn't about him, but it was about God. It's about God and what he was doing. That he had permission to reveal his sinfulness, to reveal his hurts, his weaknesses, his shortcomings, that he could go before God. But here's the thing that we understand as we walk with him, as he leads the way for us, he's willing to intervene where he has, he is, and he will that our God will intervene in the midst of his people as he begins to lead. And as he turns to us, as he leads the way, as he asks us to turn into this, remember this, as we go into him, when you pray this prayer, you're asking God to reveal the truths of your lives. But not as he asking you to go alone, but what he's saying is that I will go with you. To know that we have encouragement about how powerful our God is. When he searches our heart and the change seems impossible, God can. When we seek to replace the lies of our heart with truth, God can. When the weight of fear takes a hold of your heart, our God can. When we seek to overcome the death of sin in our heart, God can. And when he calls us to submit in all things, our God can. He doesn't send us out alone. But what he says in this prayer for David is as David's world was crashing around, David turned himself vertically in prayer, looking up to the heavens and said, God, in this moment, this is the place where I need to find you. Not out there, but right here is where it starts and it will flow from here out to there. Rather than fixing everything around, he said, fix right here what's in front of you. And because of his transforming power, he will lead us in the way of everlasting, the way of understanding into what you and I need to hear. And for so many, it's that value, it's that worth, it's the importance that you so often lie to yourself about that your heart says we're not good enough. But for many, it's getting back and turning around and falling to Christ and understanding that he truly means what he says when he says our God can. And he will. Intercede on the half of those who believe. See, through this prayer, we see something powerful, and it's this, that you and I have a direct need for a Savior. We need that grace. And because we experience grace, therefore we have peace. We are a generation who long for freedom and escape. Therefore, we need Jesus. As he seeks to meet our needs, and he longs to transform us and our lives and our hearts into his image. As we prepare to close today, if you would please stand with me. And as we start our prayer today, I'd like for us to pray together in this way. We're going to pray the Psalms 139, 23, and 24 together. 
And then I'll close with prayer. Together we say, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting.